If you'll come forward to receive our evening offering, I also want to express a word of thanks. John Sullivan and Graham McElhannon has done a lot of work on our sign this past week, and I know it's got to be a lot of frustration because they get the parts in, they put them on, we've got to order other parts, they should be in this week. Hopefully, they've done a lot of work on it, and just, just continue to pray for them that they could get that, get that uh, back, back to working. Uh, tonight's the final night uh, for the Options Pregnancy Center fundraiser. Uh, if you'd like to give in any form or fashion, you need to indicate that on your check or give it to Andy. Uh, the golf tournament is tomorrow. A reputable organization. We're trying to save lives and trust that you'll hope and pray. They pray that you'll do your part in helping that. Brother Dave Pruitt, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer, please?
go back to the Lord in prayer in uh, worship tonight. We'll get to prayer in a minute. <laughs>
Father, we do just praise your name tonight, and we thank you that we can serve a mighty God that is worthy of our praise. Father, we commit the rest of this service to you. We ask that you speak directly to our hearts, and may we be faithful to what you tell us to do. And we just ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 is our text tonight. Ephesians chapter 3, there's n a number of commentaries on the book of Ephesians. One of the smallest ones that I'm familiar with be tremendously difficult for you to find, and I'll say this and half of you in the congregation will have it. Watchman Nee, any of you have Watchman Nee's commentary on the book of Ephesians? It's simply called Sit, Walk, Stand. Uh, it talks about how that we're, we're seated together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And because of the riches that we have in Christ, we ought to stand firm. We, we ought to walk in our faith and that we're to stand firm on the truth. And I think that if there's ever a time, every day in which Christians today need to understand the truth of sit, walk, and stand is today. It's different scholars divided up in different ways. Um, some divided up into three different sections as Washman D. did. Some divide it up into two different sections. However you divide it, doesn't make any difference. I think there's some great truths that we need to learn. I think truth number one that we learned so far, or truth that we have learned so far in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 is how rich we are in Christ. Amen. Beyond comprehension, beyond measure. There's nothing that we have in life, no illustration that we can give in life to talk about how rich we are in Christ Jesus. And I'm not talking about our pocketbook because you can be the brokest man in the world financially speaking and be the richest man in the world spiritually speaking. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that? That our joy, our contentment in life does not come from our pocketbook, 
but our joy and our life comes from our experience with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There, there, in, the, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13 that we'll be looking at, looking at tonight, some say this is a parenthesis in what Paul is saying because he had been praying for the believers and at Ephesus and in verse 14 he begins praying back and uh, praying for, for the believers again. But he reminds us in this letter about the church being a mystery. Chosen tonight as I try to expound and exegete this text, dig out from this text what it is meaning to read the verses of Scripture as I get to each of the points so that I don't want to be repetitive and that I will respect your time. Twice already in this letter, Paul reminds his readers that he is a prisoner. Well, not twice already, but here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you. In chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation in where, wherein you have been called. In chapter 6 and verse 20, he says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. That word ambassador is the word for which we get, it, we, it could be, be, it could be talking about the age of ministry, but, but I believe it is saying in this particular text, it's talking about, I am a representative of Christ. I am a representative of Christ in chains. Now, no doubt, I know if the people at Ephesus or anything like the people at BB or in that matter, it, 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 people in Arkansas that I know, no, no doubt the people at Ephesus in Arkansas were, would be asking, why is Paul in prison? Why is he a prisoner of Rome? And why would God permit such a thing to happen to one of his children? Isn't that a mystery of the faith? I mean, we know those that are godly people that have walked with the Lord, that have been faithful to the Lord, that have been committed to the Lord. I, I think in my life, Homer Scruggs, I, one of the godliest men, some of you remember him, Brother Homer, one of the godliest men I've ever been around in all of my life. Never, ne never spoke a lot, was not an outspoken like I am, but, but they, just behind the scenes, and, and it, it was a mystery to me that in the latter years of his life, some type of disease, I don't remember, that Brother Homer could not speak very much. I remember thinking a lot of times, Lord, I, I, I wouldn't blame you for giving me that type of disease because oftentimes I overload, oftentimes I say things that I shouldn't say, do things that I should not do. Oftentimes I speak when I should be quiet. But why does, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? One guy commentary is, I don't know because I've never met a good person. Scripture says there's none good, no, not one. Is that, is that not correct? But, but nevertheless, you, you're, you and I are the ones to define whether it's good or bad. Could it be that it was good that Paul was in prison? Ask Diane. Was it good that she went into prison where she met the Lord? It saved my life. So, 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 so what we call bad things very well could be good things. In, in this paragraph, Paul explains his situation, and in doing so, because he was in prison and doing so, he explains one of the greatest truths in the, letter, in the letter, that is the mystery of the church. I'll tell you why, I know that I'm old-fashioned and I know that I'm a traditionalist, but I love the church. I can't get enough of the church. It boggles my mind. I'm not preaching to you. I'm, I'm not getting on to you. But it boggles my mind that, that, that every born-again, blood-bought believer would not want to be at the house of God any time and every time that the doors are open. We kind of have a negative feeling of, of mystery. Mystery in the New Testament is not something eerie or inscrutable, but rather it is a truth that is hidden by God in times past to be, to be revealed to those who are, who are his family. And I think that even today, the church is mysterious because obviously, obviously to some of us, it's a very, very important, and to others, it's not that very important. A mystery is a sacred secret revealed only to those that are believers. And in this passage of Scripture, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, Paul explains the mystery. And the mystery is this. The Gentiles, believers, are now united with the Jewish believers in one body. We, we look at that 
in that day, the Jewish people looked down upon the Gentiles as being nothing but dogs, second-class people, not worthy to enter into the temple, should not come and worship God because they were second-class citizens. Isn't that a shame? I say, isn't that a shame? But, uh, but do we have some Jewish people alive today? Maybe not looking down upon people because they're Gentiles rather than Jews, but maybe in the church today, are there people looking down on others because of their skin color? I was sad to hear just this past week, just yesterday, Church started in January where African-American church started in a predominantly, well, in a, in a white Caucasian church, a church that one time was running seven or 800 in Little Rock and now is running eight. Not 800, eight. Do you get it? They, seven or 800, they got 600 plus members and now they're running eight. So when they invited, I commend them, they, they invited a black congregation to come in and worship or have their separate worship service. Kind of found out yesterday that they have a one service is a Caucasian service and one service is African-American service and one service is a Hispanic service. Does that not strike you as odd? Should we not be able to worship together regardless of our skin colors? I'm telling you, if you're still of the opinion that black folk ought to worship with black folk and Hispanic folk ought to worship with Hispanic folk and Caucasian ought to worship with Caucasian, you need to look at the root of where you came. God has united us all as one in Christ Jesus. I have to be quite honest with you, and I'm not saying that they're wrong, but this is the problem. Even in our denomination, is very popular amongst Arkansas Baptists of starting specialty churches, there's biker churches, there's cowboy churches, there's outdoor churches, there's all different kind of churches. And they're saying, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being critical of these churches, okay? You understand from which I'm saying, I'm not being critical of these churches, but are they not in a way forming a clique of saying that, that if you're a biker, if you're an outdoorsman, if you're an archer or whatever, you come and worship with us and everybody else stay at home. Should we have teacher churches and principal churches and preacher churches and Insurance salesman churches and auto, auto, auto dealer sellers churches and, and, and mechanic churches and carpenter churches and plumber churches. I think that the, the truth of the matter in this passage of Scripture is that, is that God is inspiring Paul to write to you and I to reveal to us that the mystery of the church is both Jew and Gentile, both red, yellow, black, and white, both educated and uneducated, both rich and poor. We are all one. In Christ Jesus. Amen? He's writing as a prisoner. He's telling them a sacred secret. He's giving them an explanation. And he tells us in these 13 verses that the mystery of the church should be important to at least four people. Number one, Paul says it was important to Paul himself. Look with me in chapter 3, verses 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, indeed, if you indeed have heard the dispensation of the grace which, which is given to you, given to me for you, how that by revelation is made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which is in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit and to his holy apostles and prophets. Biblical scholars have divided up the dispensations, though that word is not used in the Bible, but they have used the dispens they have divided up history in the seven different dispensations. And the dispensation that they say that we're living in now, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you have to agree with this, but they, the dispensation that they say that we're living in now is the sixth dispensation in their estimation. And indeed, it is the dispensation of grace. Aren't you thankful that you and I come to know Christ Jesus by grace? He, he says that back in chapter two, to chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, for by grace are you saved through faith. 
and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm thankful that in God's economy of time that he allowed me to be born at this time. That when I come to understand by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that I was a sinner and that if my sin, that my sin has separated me from God and that the only thing that I needed to do to be saved is to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of my sin, and by faith trust him as my Lord and Savior. And as a result of that, certain actions will follow. I'm thankful to live in the dispensation of grace. Some, some, some may call it easy believism. I, I believe it is easy to believe. I believe that it's as easy as I've shared in every one of our block parties being saved. is as easy as ABC, acknowledge that you're a sinner and believing that Christ is a Savior and then confess him as Lord. It's easy, it's easy to do that. You and I know it's hard to live. Amen? Uh, gr 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 grace is harder to gr grace is harder to live by than, than the law. I'm thankful that I did not have to live by the law. I I'm thankful that that I, I did not have to uh, do all of the regulations that was taught in the law in the Old Testament. I'm thankful that it's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Because I I'd, I'd had a big big time problem. I'm in a big I'm having a bigger pro I'm having a big enough problem now. It's harder to live. It's harder to live by grace. Jesus talked about grace, and he says that if you look on a woman in lust, you've committed adultery. If you've hated a brother without a cause, you've committed murder. The best way to grasp the importance of the mystery in the life of the Apostle Paul what, 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 was, to, what, was to focus on the two descriptions he gives himself in this section, calling himself in verse 1 a, a prisoner and in verse 7 a minister, looking for, I, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. I spoke on that a couple of weeks ago. He was not a prisoner of Rome, but he was a prisoner, prisoner of Christ Jesus. It was not the locks on the prison that held him in, but it was the love of Jesus that held him in. I mean, it's almost as if I read in this passage of Scripture that he praised God that he was a prisoner because as a prisoner there were people that he could witness to that otherwise he could not witness to. I wondered yesterday why God sends us to the particular location and that he sent us to, and I had the opportunity to share the Lord with several people. Most of them that I shared the Lord with, well, every one of them said, that I shared the Lord with said that they were saved and have to believe that they were saved, but I also talked to some that were struggling tremendously. But, he, but, but I, too, am a prisoner, not of Rome, but I, too, you, too, are a prisoner of the Lord Jesus. He set us free so that we may be bound to serve him. Bible students, as I said, call these dispensations, uh, uh, dispensation of grace. Uh, principles of God have not changed, but his methods of dealing with mankind over the years has changed. Uh, we, we find that St. Augustine once wrote that uh, in distinguishing the ages, he said the ages are distinguished, but the scriptures are harmonized. The scripture stays the same. Amen. Even today. We've had to change our methods in reaching people. It used to be, and our, it used to be that you invite people to church and they would come. And still, the main reason people come to church is because someone invited them. In fact, if there's a visitor come to church, eighty-five eighty-five percent of those come to church because one of us invited them to church. Now, I don't know, I don't know what that tells you, but I know what it tells me that I need to be more aggressive inviting my friends, yea, even my enemies, if I have any, to to church to worship. But more importantly, in inviting them to church, and more, uh, but inviting them to church, we invite them to have a saving experience in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. So Paul says in verses one through five that this dispensation of grace, that this 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 calling of God was important to him. But not only was it important to him, but it was important to listen us Gentiles. You and I, are, you and I, are the Gentiles. He says in verse six that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gr gift of grace God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, 
who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given to me that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you get it? That's our responsibility. Ricky Strickland reminds us frequently on our prayer group, tell someone about Jesus today. Should that not be our goal, our motto, our, our theme, our, our drive, our ambition, that, that we would tell someone about Jesus today, that, 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 that this grace, this mystery is given to the Gentiles, that now we can come to God the Father through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you and I can have a personal, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You and I can have not only a relationship, but a fellowship. I don't know about you, but I am so very thankful. I believe I can speak for all of you that this fellowship with the Lord Jesus is the most precious thing that we have in this world. That, my beloved, is what makes us rich. It's not because we got a nice church that the air conditioner works at least most of the time. I'm not for sure that it's working now. Uh, we, we, we can be thankful that, 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 that God has, has revealed to us. I can be thankful that that in 1975, that down in the boondocks that nobody knew about, God was merciful on a little cotton-headed know-it-all boy and brought him the saving faith in Jesus Christ. I couldn't have done it myself. Had no ambition, no desire, no, 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 no inclination that that was going to happen. All I knew is somebody invited me. I heard things were popping, and I went. And the Holy Spirit brought forth conviction to my heart. In this, a, in this dispensation of grace, in this time for the Gentiles, it's important to the Gentiles. Second, thirdly, it was important to the angels. Look with me in verses 9 and 10. He says, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Uh, the angels stand in marvel of how God could take a sinner, sinners like you and I and bring us a saving faith. I'm of the opinion that they can't understand it completely because they've never experienced it. You and I have experienced what we know, what we, but, but God is showing to all the world, to all of creation, that he is just, that he is true in what he did. Thirdly, fourthly, it should be important to all Christians. Look with me in verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, therefore I ask that you do not lose heart in my tribulation for you, which is for your glory. Don't lose heart. There might be those that are here today that are in situation that, that maybe things are happening in your life that, that you're almost ready to give up. Don't lose heart. Sometimes we glory. Sometimes we go through tribulation for the glory and for the honor and for the praise of Jesus. Some of the most difficult things that's happened in my life has no doubt made a better person of me and I think in many cases a better pastor of me I preached some 200 funerals prior to my dad and mom dying and I can I can relate more I understand more because I've had there I've been there with a first hand experience the great truth concerning the church of Jesus Christ is not a divine afterthought. It was in the mind and heart of God prior to creation. Listen to this in closing. That he might bring a people of all nations, of all colors, of all educational backgrounds, of all uh, financial backgrounds, of all classes, that he would bring us together whether we're cowboys or teachers or mechanics or electricians, he'd all bring us all together to bring praise and honor and glory to the name of Jesus. I had the privilege in seminary 
uh, to go to the second side of Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. They bought on Popular Avenue a couple of years before I went the old Jewish synagogue that was located there. It was a, um, I'm trying to think of, Zach, help me, the, when, when you would sing, it, acoustical masterpiece. Is that the word? I mean, when, when you sung, I mean, it, it was just beautiful. And I tell you what, we'd get in chapel and there'd be three to four hundred men, mainly men that was at the seminary, three or four hundred men singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. I mean, just echoing all around. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that you don't mean it, but I'm talking about you had three or four hundred preachers that was there. Man, we, we'd been freshly saved. We'd been called to preach. We're training for ministry. And we sang not because we had a good voice, but we sang because we loved the Lord Jesus and it was echoing all around and it would just thrill my heart and thrill my soul. I know it would thrill your heart and thrill your soul to, to be able to participate and hear part of that. But I can only imagine what it's going to be like in heaven when all the saints of all the ages get home and we're in heaven, the greatest acoustical masterpiece perhaps we'll ever be in. And we're sitting around the throne and we're singing songs to bring praise and honor and glory to Jesus. Now get this, not trying to delve into a touchy, t touchy subject, but we're singing songs that he likes. I don't know what they're going to be, but this I know for sure, they're going to be good. It's going to be worshipful. I'm not going to be condemn, condemning of Brother Zach, but I'm going to tell you one thing, your piano playing as masterful as it is, not going to be compared to the one in glory. You don't know. I might be able to pay the pee in my ear. And I might even have a good sounding voice. I take the might out of it. I will have a good sounding voice. My mother, God rest her soul, thought I could sing. She used to love to hear me sing. After I got saved, we'd sit around the house and We'd sing those old gospel hymns, and I believe that she really, really loved to hear me sing. You know why? Because I was her child. Do you get it? As children of God, in the mystery of the church, we're here to forget about ourselves and magnify the Lord and praise His holy name. To lift up the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It was hidden in the past. They could not understand it, but we can understand it now. And what we need to do is do our best to bring praise and honor and glory to the name of Jesus now. This is just choir practice, Brother Zach. We're getting ready for... You remember that song, please let me sing in the choir, in the choir, please let me sing in the choir, one old voice can't be all that bad, please let me sing in the choir. I'm, I'm not making an application for singing in the choir. In fact, I'm, 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 I've got a feeling when I get to heaven, I'm going to enjoy singing far better than Nick. He don't have a whole lot of improvement. Well, i got a whole lot to go for. The mystery of the church. All of the... All of God's divine resources are available for you and I who sincerely want his help in accomplishing his purpose on earth. One of the greatest satisfactions I have in life is knowing that I'm doing what God has called me to do. Knowing I have no doubt, no reservation that God has called me to be a pastor. I have no doubt, I have no reservation that this is where I'm supposed to be. I have no doubt, no reservation that God wanted us to be at 10,200 West 36th Street, Little Rock, Arkansas yesterday. To be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed in the crowd. But Brother Clay, you helped me. We had 78 people there. We had five people saved. What would you say? 6.75% of the crowd gave their heart to Jesus? Could I get a good glory to God? Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. Would you stand with me, please? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and opportunity to gather in your house to worship you and acknowledge you as King of kings and Lord of lords.
And Lord, I don't know what invitational hymn that Brother Zach has chosen us to sing. But Lord, I pray for this one time. Oh yes, Lord, if people need to respond, I want them to respond to you. But this one time, help us as a church to sing with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds, all of our strength. Help us to sing as if we mean it. Because we really do tonight. For we pray in Jesus' name.